to hear the Burian Lecture for 2024 um, with our amazing Bur Burian Lecturer, Dr. James Jackson from, um, from Vanderbilt. And, and I'll introduce him in a second, but I want to tell a couple of stories about, about how we ended up with this Burian Lecture. So first of all, I want to acknowledge all of the members of the College of Health and Human Services diversity, equity, and inclusion committees, both the faculty and staff committee, as well as the student committee. So if you could raise your hand if you're part of one of those groups, that would be wonderful. So thank you very much for, for all of you for making this evening possible, because it really takes a village to do that. Um, and secondly, I want to introduce myself. So I'm Jennifer Harrison. I'm very proud to be the interim dean of the College of Health and Human Services here at Western Michigan University. I use um, she, her pronouns and, um, and am so proud to serve this college as we continue to focus on, on interprofessional practice and education, on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and specifically on the inclusion of underrepresented and um, and other individuals who go on to serve in health and human services professions that are so important because they are gonna be our physical therapists and our nurses and our social workers and our public health professionals in Southwest Michigan, throughout the state, the region, nation, and globally um, and beyond. So we're really pleased to be doing that and also to have this focus today with our Burian Lecture this evening, as well as with our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Conference that will be held tomorrow in this same room from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. focus on the topic of health equity, um, which is also what um, much of our research is, um, is focused on throughout the college. I see, I see several of my faculty colleagues who are all doing really impressive research. I just gave Dr. Jackson our recent research portfolio to really highlight some of our trauma and resilience, some of our neurodevelopmental, neurodiverse, and neurodegenerative research, some of our research on medical devices, on behavioral health, and on other topics that, that really tie in importantly to inclusion, accessibility, diversity, and equity in all the work that we do. Um, I also want to kind of share that that um, my colleague, Dr. Ann Chaplo, had the opportunity to send me an NPR um, interview that was done with Dr. Jackson about long COVID and long COVID recovery and to kind of highlight that he was highlighting very clearly the importance of speech language pathologists, which warmed our hearts, and of occupational therapists, which warmed our hearts in terms of that interprofessional role of all of our disciplines to think about long COVID and other chronic disease prevention, treatment, and recovery, supporting people in our communities. And um, when she reached out to him, when Dr. Chaplow reached out to him, he said, well, as a matter of fact, I'll be in Kalamazoo, Michigan in, in early October because my parents live there and I grew up there. And so, um, and as a matter of fact, my mom is a Western Michigan University alumni. So we were very pleased to be able to meet in person with Dr. Jackson um, this last fall. And one of the things that he shared with us after we invited him, after Dr. Dennis and others invited him to the Berean Lecture, was that with his new book, which is his second book about chronic illness recovery, which is called Clearing the Fog, From Surviving to Thriving with Long COVID, A Practical Guide, which I can share, like my copy is all marked up and all, all dog-eared because because it really is almost a workbook style. And so for those of us that had the opportunity to participate in our book club, um, it was a wonderful read and looking forward to Dr. Jackson's presentation today. For those of you that haven't yet read um, Clearing the Fog, we would invite you to join with our community partners Book Bug, which is a local, um, local, a local bookstore to purchase your own copy. And if you're really nice, we, you might even be able to get Dr. Jackson to sign your copy um, this evening or tomorrow. And one of the things that when we invited Dr. Jackson um, and he, he graciously accepted, even though he's a world-renowned researcher and speaker about the topic of chronic illness recovery and specifically long COVID neurocognitive recovery. And he said, you know, I've had the opportunity to present at Oxford and I, he was just in Paris last week and really to present nationally and internationally because of the success of his research projects and also his book. But my, I gotta tell you, my parents are pretty excited that I'm coming to Western Michigan University <laughs> because of their connection to the university and to the College of Health and Human Services. So we're so glad 
that thanks to his mom's alumni status that we could, we could make his parents proud, <laughs> right? We all wanna make our parents proud no matter how old we are. So um, our guest lecturer tonight is Dr. Jim Jackson, who's an internationally renowned expert on long COVID and its effects on cognitive and mental health functioning. He's a licensed psychologist specializing in neuropsychology and cognitive rehabilitation and is a research associate professor of medicine, psychiatry, and behavioral sciences, and director of the Long-Term Outcomes ICU Recovery Center in the Department of Medicine at Vanderbilt University. Um, and uh, so please, so we do have some small gifts, not only for Dr. Jackson, but also for his parents, because, that's, because that was an important part of, of getting someone of his caliber here. Um, and so I'll give those to Jim so that you could take them to your, thank to your you. parents. Very so, kind of you, thank you. Thank thanks so much. Thank you. And, uh, and please welcome to the um, 2024 Berean Lecture, Dr. James Jackson. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jennifer. That was really a lovely introduction. And, and that is a true story, actually, that um, some years ago I was at, at the, in the UK and, and I spoke at Oxford and, and, and Cambridge and I was really excited. I told my mom and dad I was speaking at Cambridge and they were like, oh, that's fine. And then um, I mentioned that I was speaking at Western Michigan and they were like, oh, that's amazing. <laughs> so um, anyway, it's, it's funny and I will say, I, I will say that um, this is really a, a, such a gem of a program that you're developing here. And uh, I think it's quite unique in the things that it offers. And I've been so thoroughly impressed by the people that I've met here. And if you're a student here, by the opportunities that you have to grow and, and foster uh, the beginnings of a career here. So uh, you're in exactly the right place. And uh, it's really exciting for, for me to be here. Um, I almost wasn't here. Uh, my alarm went off this morning at uh, 3.30. My plane left at 5.30, and, and we moved um, recently to a new neighborhood, which is, which is lovely. We're about to be empty nesters, and so we moved from a, a neighborhood that wasn't really a neighborhood with big lots and houses far apart and all of that to a neighborhood that is kind of a planned community with, with no yard, and everybody's kind of on top of everybody else, and I think we're going to be less lonely there than we would have been, but we're farther from the airport. So the alarm went off at 3.30, and I thought, you know, I'm gonna set that thing back to 3.45, and I did. And it went off at 3.45, I got up, and I got out the door at 4.11, and I got to the airport, uh, I don't know, maybe five, and I just barely made it. My, my car, of course, was, was in the parking lot, and my backup plan was if I miss this flight, I'm just gonna jump in my car and I'll be here by six, um, but that, that didn't happen. So I, I, I'm glad that I made it, good to be with you. And we're gonna talk today about long COVID, and if somebody can tell me when I have five minutes left or 10 or something, that, that'd be helpful. I've been known to, to, to uh, spend a lot of time on the first 10 slides and then have to rush through the final 20 or 30, so I won't do that today. But we're gonna talk about long COVID, and, and I think it's a really important topic. Uh, it's interesting. I was on fresh air, as, as Jennifer alluded, um, in May of, of 2023, and uh, that was May 9th, uh, to be specific. That was my birthday, and that was exciting, and, and all of that. And then uh, about a day after that, maybe two days, I think it was May 11th, that was the day that the federal government declared the pandemic over, if you, if you recall, they declared the pandemic over. And suddenly, um, this fever pitch of attention that people had on COVID and long COVID, um, it, it changed dramatically. And suddenly no one was talking about it. No one was interested in it. And um, it really fell off the radar. Uh, no reporters were calling. Patients felt like they were forgotten. And uh, that continues to be the case with many of our patients. Many of them feel very marginalized. And um, in the spirit of DEI, and I'll integrate some DEI focused comments here, what we've seen in long COVID, especially since the pandemic has been declared over, is we've seen a phenomenon where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. If you have resources and deep pockets and you can fly to see a specialist in San Francisco or in Timbuktu for that matter, uh, you may well get the care that you need. And um, if you don't have those resources, um, you're ever, ever, ever closer to the margins. And that's, and that's what we see. And I think long COVID has highlighted in many ways the disparities 
um, that people face. I was giving a talk on Long COVID Awareness Day um, just last Friday, I was on a webinar. We were in Paris on spring break and it was so lovely, we did all the things. And um, my wife was mildly frustrated that we had to get back to the apartment early so I could be on this webinar, but that's how it was. And um, there was a physician on the webinar and he, he seemed really delightful and kind, but, um, but he runs a clinic and the cost of the clinic uh, to join, it's concierge medicine for long COVID, uh, the cost of the clinic is $1,500 a month, right? $1,500 a month. And that's outside of the insurance system, right? So who can afford that, right? Um, the people who need it the most probably are the people who are not getting it. So uh, we've got a long way to go. And one of the biggest challenges, not the only one, but one of the particular challenges in the context of long COVID is cognitive functioning, mental health as well. Um, there really is a little bit of what I call the unholy trinity of problems and that that trinity or trifecta is cognitive problems, mental health problems, and physical functioning difficulties. Fatigue is probably the main one. Um, I'm not an expert in management of fatigue, but we are gonna talk about cognition and mental health in particular today. Um, this is Vanderbilt's campus, I will say. I'm not sure we have a building uh, as nice as this one, um, and I wish we did. So this is really beautiful. Uh, the Vanderbilt campus, though, is lovely. And um, if you're in Nashville, come by and see me at 2525 West End. Maybe send me an email first, uh, but it, it would be good to connect with you. Um, and, and I would mention, by the way, uh, just briefly, um, it is so good to be home. This really is home for me. 523 West Melody, right off Shaver Road, where the, where the bowling alley used to be, and now there's a Myers, if, if you know where that is. Um, that's Portage Central uh, High School there, used to be. Uh, that it looked like that. That's Austin Lake down in the bottom where I fished in the lily pads for, for years and decades. Um, that is Mr. Crispy, the mascot at the Celery Flats. Has anyone been to the Celery Flats Museum? I worked for the city for a couple years. So that's not me in the Mr. Crispy suit, but I did wear that suit many times and I marched in what was called the Duda Parade. I don't know if that's still uh, a, 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 a thing. And uh, so anyway, good, good memories and, uh, and nothing was really gonna keep me from, from coming here, coming home. So uh, let's get to the meat of things and, and talk a bit. And, and this, uh, this presentation, by the way, is probably gonna be more practical than scientific. Um, it's grounded in science, but um, I think all things being equal, practical is better. And, and I trust you'll find this very practical. So, um, People talk about long COVID and, and people use the term very loosely. They use it without a lot of precision and different agencies even today define it a little bit differently and it's evolving. But in general, long COVID is um, the phenomenon of having persistent signs and symptoms and conditions that continue or develop after an initial COVID-19 infection. Um, so the notion here is you have COVID, um, you get sick, maybe not hugely sick, maybe just a little bit sick, maybe you've never been in the hospital, probably not in the ICU, and that initial acute infection goes away, and you're glad it is, uh, glad it's gone, and then at a certain point after that, you realize, oh gosh, I'm forgetting people's names, and um, I just bumped into the car in the parking lot, I never do that, and really fatigued, and I'm having symptoms of PTSD or whatever it is. There's a huge range. People talk about a hundred and some odd symptoms of long COVID. Um, that's probably technically true. That's a little bit of a misnomer. Most people with long COVID aren't reporting 145 symptoms, right? They're probably your 10 or 12 that cluster. But basically the initial infection is gone. You have new problems that you didn't have before. And long COVID can occur even after a mild or very mild infection. It can be mild or it can be severe. It can be a nuisance. Uh, recently, I was hiking at this lovely trail, uh, Warner Park in, in Nashville. Um, it's where I always spot armadillos, and it's really lovely. They don't have those in Michigan, I, I don't think, right? So I'm really fascinated by those, and I was hiking not too long ago. There was a stone in my shoe, and it was a nuisance, but I, it was fine, and I took it out. So long COVID is sometimes like a nuisance, and people manage quite well with that nuisance, or it can be profoundly disruptive as it often is. Um, and again, it can vary widely with regard to nature, um, but largely for our purposes, it's cognitive or physical or mental health related. One of the reasons that I have chosen to focus on cognition 
is because I believe, and I, and, and I think this is a theme that good rehabilitation clinicians would endorse, what I'm about to mention. One reason I focus a lot on cognition is um, I want to be concerned about what patients are concerned about, right? Um, Stephen Covey had a great example in one of his many books, if, if you remember him. Uh, I mentioned him to some of our young students along with many other references and they say, who's that? Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, what's that? Um, but Stephen Covey wrote a lot of books, great strategic thinker, and, and he had this lovely um, word picture metaphor or whatever that he used, and he talked about the idea of a ladder leaning up against a wall, and he described a man in this book who was climbing this ladder, and he got to the top, and he sort of beat his chest. He was so happy he was at the top of the ladder, and then he looked around, and he realized, oh my gosh, that ladder's leaning against the wrong wall, Right? Oh no, I've climbed to the top, it's leaning against the wrong wall, what's the point? The point is that, that the ladders, if you will, that we use as clinicians, they need to be leaning against the right wall, meaning um, the issues I care about need to be the issues that patients care about, right? They need to not be issues of concern that I'm projecting on you. Hey, you need to fix this. Well, I don't care about that, right? Um, so when you talk to patients, and this is true Today, it was true long before COVID, it'll be true after COVID. When you talk to them about functioning, what area of functioning do you most want to preserve? Most patients prioritize brain functioning above virtually all else because what they will tell you is, if my brain is intact, I can find a way to cope with physical disability in a wide array of things. But if my brain isn't intact, that's not much of a quality of life that I'm gonna have if my brain is not intact, right? Um, and some of you have lived that experience as you've had elderly family members who battle Alzheimer's or dementia, you see the tragedy of a body that is intact, right? With a brain that is not working. So patients above all things, at least the ones I engage, they value cognition. It's not that they don't value physical function, but cognition's important, that's why we study it. Um, COVID severity and risk of long COVID. Um, I'll mention a few things quickly. Um, some individuals with long COVID survived a severe illness. Some of them were in the ICU for weeks. Some of our patients on a ventilator for months, um, experiencing organ failure, a range of other issues, delirium. Others were never in the hospital and barely ill at all. So as we talk about long COVID and severity, uh, while it is true, that um, in general, the risk of long COVID severity is associated with how sick you were. In general, that's true. We certainly see some people who had just a touch of COVID, just a touch, and they're very, very impaired. So, so we need to not be um, prejudiced against, biased against those people who were never really in the hospital, perhaps not hugely sick. They too can have very poor outcomes, and we'll unpack what those are. Um, how many people have long COVID? Uh, the answer is a lot. Um, this is Mexico City. Um, I haven't been there. I did just get back from Paris, which was really wonderful. Um, the only downside being that my wife and daughter want to go, go, go all the time. So every day we were out of the apartment at 8 o'clock and not back until 9 at night. I was really tired. Um, great trip we had. But, but this isn't Paris. This is Mexico City. And the country of Mexico has, I think, about 170 million people, 180 million, something like that. And most people would say that that's about the number of people in the world that have long COVID. It's a huge number. And um, it's a number that represents a staggering public health burden, right? And that's partly why we study this, because the ramifications and the implications for public health are dramatic and draconian and profound. Choose any word you want and it is not going to be too strong. Um, there are issues related to um, diversity, equity, inclusion. There are issues related to racism and very differential treatments of different populations, sadly. Um, this is a story that got a lot of news in the early days of COVID. Uh, Dr. Susan Moore, uh, a physician, and passed away um, after receiving what was frankly um, racist and very uh, unfair and unkind and cruel, again, whatever word you want to use, uh, unjust treatment where she came to the ER, had a lot of legitimate complaints and was dismissed. And we see this. We see this not only on the basis of 
color. We see this on the basis of things like uh, rurality. That's a term that I have a hard time pronouncing. Um, people are in the country, they're dismissed, right? People who sound a particular way are dismissed. People who look a particular way all too often are dismissed. And there are indeed actual changes, differences in health outcomes um, that have been studied by race and by ethnicity. And I think we need to do a better job trying to tease out why exactly it is that uh, underrepresented minorities, for instance, have relatively poorer outcomes uh, with regard to key metrics in the context of COVID. But, but this is really a phenomenon. Um, what are key symptoms of long COVID? I'll mention a few here, but again, we're gonna target a couple. Uh, so fatigue, sleep disturbance, depression, cognitive impairment, just a couple of examples. Um, we're gonna spend most of our time talking about long COVID and the brain. And um, if you've been following the news, um, there still is a fair bit of coverage about this, actually a little bit of a resurgence of coverage about this. There was a great article in the New York Times uh, about two weeks ago um, about a study done uh, in the United Kingdom that showed that people who had long COVID had a decrease in IQ of about three points. Did anybody see that? Anyone read that article? You did? So my friend Pam Bellick wrote the article and, and, uh, and I was quoted and many other people were um, in the article. And, um, and three points isn't a huge amount, but it's not nothing. And, and if, you, if you looked a little further, dug a little deeper in the article, if you were hospitalized with COVID, uh, you had a six point drop in your IQ. If you were in the ICU with COVID, you had a 10 point drop in your IQ. So, um, so we can debate um, what the actual impact is on average perhaps, but in aggregate, uh, there's study after study after study, there's ample evidence, not anecdotal, but strong science that shows that for many people, long COVID is harmful to the brain and it affects a range of cognitive domains. And um, I do discuss these in some detail in, in my book and, I, and I'll mention my book quickly. Um, several people have said to me on podcasts and various other places, you know, you're a really reluctant pitch man for your book, Jim. And, and I am, you know, I don't feel, uh, I don't feel good doing a P.T. Barnum routine uh, trying to hawk this book. And I think it's a helpful book. And if you want to learn about a lot of the things that we're discussing here, I think it will be useful to you. And one of the things the book talks a lot about that goes beyond COVID is um, the way that cognitive functioning is impacted by chronic illness. And that's something that we need to pay much more attention to. COVID certainly, long COVID has become a chronic illness. It indeed affects people's brains. Again, before COVID was on the scene though, there were huge numbers of people, are huge numbers of people whose brains are affected by, I'm gonna go down the list, by lupus, by chemotherapy treatment, by multiple scler sclerosis, by the effects of cancer. I, you know, I could go on and on, right? Chronic fatigue, et cetera, et cetera. Um, heart disease, diabetes, so many medical issues that have cognitive implications, which I think, and I'm getting a little bit, a little bit ahead of myself, which I think um, has important implications for people like speech and language pathologists and occupational therapists who are experts in cognitive rehab. You have so much to offer. You have so much to offer and no one else is as equipped. This is an important message and it's the gospel truth. No one else is as equipped to offer the help that you can offer as you are. They're, they're really not. Um, I will say, and, and I hope this is okay to say, um, I do think we've learned during, during the pandemic that SLPs and OTs, they've got a little bit of a branding problem. Uh, that is, the public at large doesn't understand how pivotal the role is that you all play, right? They really, they really don't. And it bothers me so much when another professional says, what's an SLP? And I'm like, you know, have you been living under a rock? Like, what are you, you know, what are you talking about? And when I explain it to them, it actually makes perfect sense. But I think all too often, um, there's this notion that, hey, if you've got a cognitive problem that doesn't explicitly involve speech, as in stroke, right? Um, what would an SLP have to do? An SLP has so much to offer. 
So uh, we're going to talk about the relevant contributions of SLPs and OTs to helping people with impairments in these domains. But I mentioned these domains because these are really the key domains where we see deficits in long COVID. We see problems in attention. We see problems in executive functioning. We see problems in processing speed. Um, in the early days of the war in Iraq, and again, I, I work at the VA quite a lot, do a lot of research there, worked with a lot of patients from Fort Campbell uh, in Kentucky who were um, among the first to serve in Iraq and Afghanistan and worked with so many patients with TBI. And many people in the media early in the war in Iraq, they used to say, um, TBI is the signature injury of the war in Iraq. Some of you may have heard that term, TBI is the signature injury. And I would submit to you processing speed in particular is the signature injury in long COVID, processing speed and perhaps attention. We don't see a lot of problems with memory as such. We see a lot of patients come to us complaining of memory, with, with great sincerity complaining of memory. And then we refer them for cognitive testing. We do a little bit of a drill down and we find that what they're actually talking about is processing speed or attention, which is to say um, they can't remember where they put their keys, they don't remember where they put their wallet, they don't remember where they put their key fob that gets them into the gym. Uh, that's something I mentioned because I lose it all the time, right? But the problem isn't memory per se, the problem is they're often so preoccupied with life they're not attending. So we don't see a lot of amnestic memory deficits, we see um, a fair number of problems with working memory. Um, I'm going to target one thing in particular, though. Processing speed is a problem, probably the most common problem, but closely related to that are deficits in executive functioning. And executive functioning is, is important for us to study and to be aware of because executive functioning is essential to so many different abilities, right? So many different functions. So. Managing your money, managing your income taxes, we're heading into tax time, right? I mean, I, I've never done my taxes myself, wouldn't ever attempt to, some of you may, right? But occasionally we see patients who do, and as their executive functioning becomes impaired, they make big mistakes, right? Um, physicians who are used to managing complicated clinical cases, their executive functioning is impaired. They're not so capable anymore. Um, attorneys who are uh, very good at strategy, their executive functioning is impaired. They're not so able to shift from one idea to another and back. Um, managing medication becomes very hard. We had a patient some years ago who developed quite severe executive functioning and, and he, took, um, he took 20 or so medications a day I, and I wouldn't recommend his approach to taking them but what he would do is he would take them in a bottle, put them all in one bottle and at a certain time of the day, he'd just take the bottle, he'd take all, all 20 pills. And Richard, it, it, a good friend of mine, patient, passed away uh, about six months ago, sadly. And uh, Richard was at home one day watching Wheel of Fortune um, with his elderly mom, lived with his elderly mom. And he had just picked up a prescription, a month-long prescription of warfarin, uh, blood thinner, um, at the doctor. And he hadn't uh, parceled it out yet. He didn't have a month's supply yet, so he had... He had not one pill bottle in his pocket, but he had two. He had his daily supply of 20 pills, and he had his brand new prescription of warfarin in his other pocket. And Vanna White was doing whatever she does on Wheel of Fortune, and uh, you know they were they were watching he and his mom. And he felt the the pill bottle in his uh, in his pants, and he took the top off, and he took you know 28 or 30 warfarin. And uh, 10 or 15 minutes later, he noticed that there was another pill bottle in his other pocket and he was horrified, realized what he did and he called 911 and he was admit, admitted to the ICU and he almost died. Um, that's an executive function, def, executive function deficit at the bottom. That's what that is, okay. So um, executive functioning is something I mentioned just because it has real world implications. And the good news, the good news is, and there's good news, there is cognitive rehab. There are approaches to cognitive rehab that are effective for the management of executive dysfunction. We're gonna talk a bit about those. Um, so what does the literature say about um, prevalence of long, uh, of cognitive impairment in individuals with long COVID? Uh, this is just a smattering of studies. If, if you were to go to PubMed, um, you would find literally thousands. And, and one thing that's true with PubMed, um, since the onset of the pandemic, uh, there's been so much published 
there are a lot of people who say, gosh, we need more research on long COVID. And, and I usually qualify that and say, I don't really think we need more research. We need more good research. We need more good research. There's a lot of really bad research. You can find it. It's been published. Um, but this is good research. Um, and um, I'm just going to list uh, details from a number of papers. 53% of people with long COVID report experiencing cognitive slowing. Um, in a survey of almost a thousand people who had COVID, a quarter had mild cognitive impairment on verbal fluency tests where I give you a letter of the alphabet and you have to generate as many words as you can think of to start with an F or an A or an S. Um, the number of words generated by patients with COVID was lower than in the controls. Uh, people with COVID-19 had lower MOCA scores, MOCA being the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. Uh, in a study of 50 recovered patients um, that is recovered from acute infection, uh, nearly a quarter had mild cognitive impairment, largely reflected in decreased executive functioning. If you look a little more scientifically, if you will, if you look at harder outcomes, um, there are findings which include atrophy of the hippocampus, gray matter, et cetera, on MRI. So there are plenty of signals, and if you interact with patients, move beyond the scientific descriptions and interact with patients, real patients, as we do in the family of support groups that we have, um, what you'll hear is you'll hear these stories repeated again and again and again and again and again. So often from so many different people with no connection to each other, that it gives them credibility. There's, uh, there's no um, incentive for them to be lying, exaggerating symptoms. Uh, you know, we interact with people who are partners in law firms and they are former chiefs of neonatology and they are, you know, doctors and lawyers and they're world beaters, so to speak, uh, right? They are masters of the universe and um, going on disability is not something they're financially incentivized to do, right? That's not what they want to do. And yet that's exactly what's happened. So uh, this is a huge problem. Um, what are the mechanisms of uh, cognitive impairment in long COVID? It's a really complicated question. And, um, and I think sometimes people in the media in particular, in my mind, show a little bit of their ignorance when they act like this is a settled question. I don't think we know exactly what the answer is. Um, Often in many diseases, we're looking for a single solution, a single explanation, as if there is one thing that is driving this particular outcome, in this case, impairment in long COVID. And I think there rarely is one thing, right? Almost never one thing. Things that have been advanced would include inflammatory processes, would include viral persistence. Uh, there was a really interesting paper that came out recently in, I think, Nature and Neuroscience last week. And um, it suggested, uh, to reference the, the picture on the bottom there, it suggested that um, people who had long COVID with cognitive complaints may have what is called blood-brain barrier permeability, that the intactness of the blood-brain barrier um, may not have the same integrity in people with COVID that it normally does, that there is some seepage so that, so that harmful neurotoxic substances can perhaps break through that blood-brain barrier harm the brain, that could very well be a mechanism um, driving cognitive impairment in patients. Uh, it, it is associated with inflammation. Um, but it's more complicated th than this. Um, if you were in the ICU, for instance, you've had a lot of exposures that didn't include COVID. You likely were on a ventilator for days or weeks or months. You may have had a hypoxic brain injury. Um, you experienced delirium. Uh, in some cases, what we've seen, for instance, is people develop mental health challenges um, in the context of their long COVID. And depression or PTSD or OCD or drinking too much, uh, returning perhaps to some addictive habits that didn't, that, that didn't exist for a while, those are driving new and worsening cognitive impairment. When we see the role of mental health um, emerge, I'm often quite hopeful about that because sometimes when we improve the mental health issues, then the cognitive issues really follow. We saw a young man not too long ago. Um, he came to see me, he and his mother, they were from um, another country across the pond and we referred him to, uh, to an SLP who was amazing. 
and um, turned out he had developed quite a drinking problem. It was pretty severe. It was new during the pandemic. Uh, he did have long COVID, it seemed, but when he got treatment for his alcoholism and his alcohol abuse, his cognition really improved. So, um, so be curious about mechanisms. Be open to the idea that there are many, and be open to the idea that in some cases, um, we can impact those mechanisms and people can improve. Uh, and don't believe, by the way, the comment, all too common, that if you have long COVID, it is what it is, right? I'm not about rainbows and unicorns dancing, right? Like I'm a realist, I think, but people with long COVID get better. They don't all get better. They don't all get completely better. Some of them don't, some of them don't get better at all, but many of them get meaningfully better. Um, this is an interesting thing that I'll discuss here. Uh, you hear the term brain fog a lot. Uh, does anyone know what that term means? People heard that term. Um, so I think if you ask 50 people, uh, you know, if we went to downtown Kalamazoo, is there still a walking mall? Is that still a thing, right? So we could take a field trip down there and we could walk up to people and say, what is brain fog, right? Uh, it'd be interesting, maybe fun. Um, we go to the bookstore and ask your customers about that and you could talk to 10 different people and you get 10 different answers, right? And you could talk to 10 different doctors, actually, and you could probably get five different answers. So there's no good consensus about what brain fog is. Uh, when I talk to my patients, they very much don't like the term. They feel like fog is a little bit minimizing. Most of them, most of them think that, not all of them. Um, so in some cases, a better term may be brain injury. Um, Assuming it's accurate, right? Not everyone with long COVID and cognitive problems has a brain injury, but many people actually do, right? Many people actually do. So um, more than brain fog, I probably prefer the term cognitive impairment. You can use whatever term you wanna use at the end of the day, but um, a brain injury is important conceptually because um, as you know very well, we know what to do when people have brain injuries, right? We engage them in cognitive rehabilitation, right? We have them see an OT. We have them see an SLP. Um, they learn skills they didn't have before, right? They learn to take a complex puzzle and break it down into manageable pieces, right? They learn to approach problems differently. They develop mindfulness. They integrate strategies, right? And often, even though that's not hugely sexy necessarily, right, it's really powerful. And when we send people to rehab, not surprisingly to me, they get better, right? They get better. Um, but if you don't think there's an injury, you typically aren't gonna send someone to rehab. And, and all too often, um, while people are very quick to send patients to PT for uh, small and medium and large size things, and appropriately so, uh, they're often relatively less aware that there's a pathway for people with cognitive impairment too, right? And that pathway is SLPs and uh, that pathway is OTs. So uh, in some cases, brain injuries, um, be cautious about the term brain fog. I will say this, and I think this is important. Um, there really is not much evidence that COVID causes dementia. And um, that's good news, right? That's good news. Um, now, um, we, we see some signal and there's some evidence in the literature for this, but only in a very specified population. So some of you may have elderly parents, a mother, a father, aunt, grandma, whatever, and you may remember when Aunt Jane broke her hip, to use this example, um, your mom or someone said, you know, Aunt Jane was never the same after that, right? She went downhill. I, People remember or have experience with this, right? When, when Granny got that big surgery, she never really recovered. She went downhill. And that's not just folklore and folk wisdom. That's a real phenomenon that has been studied widely and proven. And, and in this context, what it means is that there are some patients who survived COVID who were already in the early stages of a dementing process, okay? Um, they perhaps were not expressing dementia symptoms clinically yet, but they were, they were trucking along and they were gonna get there. And what seems to have happened with COVID is that process that was moving along slowly and incrementally has been ramped up quite a bit. So we see some cases where people in their eighth decade, let's say, they seem to have an accelerated experience of cognitive decline 
and we believe that they're transitioning into a frank dementia, sometimes Alzheimer's, sometimes not, more rapidly than they would have. And that's a very different case than someone who is 55, uh, happens to be my age, uh, someone who's 55, or for that matter, 65, who feels like they're not quite as sharp as they were before, um, after COVID, unless this is progressing and it is clearly getting worse month after month after month, it's likely not dementia, and we're grateful for that. Um, when should people seek care for cognitive problems in long COVID? When should they engage these more fully, talk to a professional further? When should they do that? Um, I think there are two criteria that, that I use, and one of them has to do with persistence, and the other has to do with disruption, okay? So um, if you've had cognitive impairment, for some time now, it seems to be new or it seems to be worsening. It isn't going away, it isn't improving, it's persisting. That's a concern. And if it is so severe that it is disruptive, that's also a concern. And if you wed those together, persisting and disruptive, don't pass go or pass go, whatever the monopoly phrase is, right? Go to get your $100 or whatever the phrase there is, right? Uh, go on and go to the doctor, go see the neuropsychologist, get an assessment. We'll talk about how to do that. But those are the criteria, persistence and disruption. Now, disruption looks different to different people, and disruption is partly a function of what we call cognitive reserve. So cognitive reserve is this idea, and I'm going to flex, but it's not going to be impressive here, okay? You won't, you won't see any change here, okay? But, but uh, cognitive reserve is sort of the degree that your brain is a muscle that, that has grown from early childhood experiences, educational exposure, learning another language, having a home that's enriched with, in my day, world book encyclopedias, and you know, all those things, right? All those things contribute to what we call cognitive reserve. And for people who have a lot of education, education is a good marker of reserve. For people who have a lot of education and a lot of reserve, often what happens is they're basically to, able to withstand a, a lot more of a beating, a lot more of an insult from whatever the thing is. In this case, it's COVID, right? So um, their reserve is a buffer, right? So sometimes you've been hit pretty hard, but you're still not on the mat. You're kind of stumbling. You're still maybe even managing. And in some cases, um, where we see this show up as we see it show up in neuropsych testing. So often with the, with the high functioning masters of the universe professionals that we see, they, they complain of cognitive problems. They go see a neuropsychologist. The neuropsychologist says, oh gosh, um, your IQ is about 125 and that's about at the 87th percentile or something and you are fine, right? And that's true and that's fine unless your IQ was 150 before that, right? And then it's actually quite a big problem. So we see this happen not infrequently where our high achieving folks, university professors, professionals often, they do the neuropsych testing, they really get marginalized because they're told they're fine, they're really not fine, right? And what happened was they had a lot of reserve, that reserve is a buffer, and they're still kind of functioning maybe above average, but not for them. So persistent and disruption. Um, who do you see? What do you do if you're having cognitive problems? Where do you refer your folks? Um, you refer them to a neuropsychologist. Uh, that's the gold standard, if you will. An SLP often is very adept at cognitive testing, but there are some limits to the, um, to the depth and breadth of their experience. They're gonna do more like a 35 minute evaluation uh, less like a five-hour evaluation is going to have some limitations perhaps in terms of how definitive it is because that is not their stock and trade. They've chosen not to be a neuropsychologist. A neuropsychologist uh, is going to write a long report, often pretty boring, often creating insomnia, like all these things if you read it, right? They're going to do really long assessment, but that assessment, that gold standard assessment is what a patient needs. And, and part of the reason that assessment is important um, and any mid-sized city has a neuropsychologist or two or three or four or five, and I acknowledge here 
that the number of people with long COVID greatly overwhelmed the resources available, right? So if you wanted everyone with long COVID to get a neuropsych test done, maybe we would finish that endeavor in 400 years or something, right? That's not happening anytime soon. Equally, if you want everyone with long COVID to see an OT and a PT and an SLP, that's not gonna happen, right? So there's some problems with scalability, problems with uh, availability, but regardless, this is a gold standard. And um, one of the reasons that, that neuropsych testing is really important, and this is a friend of mine, Samantha, by the way, and there's a lovely article about her. Some of you may have read it early in the pandemic. Samantha was featured in an article um, in the New York Times. Uh, again, uh, Pam Bellick, their reporter, wrote this. And Samantha was, um, was a master's level, kind of a community mental health worker. She led a team of people, uh, managed a, a halfway house, if you will, really delightful and super effective and efficient, and um, developed long COVID, had really striking cognitive problems, and she went to the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab. Does anybody know that place in, in Chicago? Well known. And that was transformative to her. Uh, her employers allowed her to basically take several months off, and her entire job for several months was cognitive rehab. It was immersive, and it was, it was uh, I was about to say multidisciplinary. It was interprofessional, which is the right word to use. And um, Sam's life really transformed. And, uh, and I, I met her actually at a, at a lecture I gave at USC. She was there. And um, I'll mention, oddly enough, I was in Chicago at a restaurant uh, about a year ago. And I looked up and I said to my wife, that's Sam, that's Samantha. My wife said, what are you talking about? And I thought, well, I hope it's her. I walked over and greeted her, and it, it, it was. So, um, so she's a testimony, actually, to how cognitive uh, rehabilitation can help you improve. But, but the point with neuropsych testing is a neuropsych testing can identify where the cognitive problems are that a patient is having, and then you can target those for rehab, right? So if, if you think your problem is memory, right, you're earnest about that, as our patients are, they really are. Like, hey, Dr. Jackson, believe me, I've got problems with memory. I'm a little more, I'm a little more kind of cautious, like let's make sure, let's do the testing first, let's make sure it's not processing speed, right? Let's make sure we're not leaning the ladder against the wrong wall, right? So neuropsych testing is gonna tell us, well, what does Samantha need exactly? Does she need rehabilitation of her memory? Or is it attention, is it processing speed? So, so um, neuropsych testing is helpful for that. And um, cognitive rehab uh, is the next step. And again, that can be done by an OT, an SLP, um, a neuropsychologist rarely, uh, seldom a physician, typically an SLP or an OT. Um, and ideally, and this slide's a little grainy, so forgive me, ideally that person is going to move us away from the dichotomy that we still engage in far too much, and I think it's a concern, and that is treating the body and the mind as if they're two different things, right? Um, long before COVID, I cut my teeth, if you will, on research with ICU survivors, right? We worked with patients critically ill in the ICU on a ventilator, typically with sepsis or another condition called acute respiratory distress syndrome, widely known as ARDS, A-R-D-S. Anyway, um, both of those problems, they're, they're kind of pulmonary in nature, um, sepsis and, and ARDS, and those are both what we call neck down problems. Okay, they're happening in the lungs, in the ICU, you're on a respirator. And for years, a lot of people thought, you know, because those are happening below the neck, those don't affect what's going on above the neck. Not true, right? Silly. What's going on below the neck absolutely affects what happens above the neck, right? What's happening in the body affects the mind. What's happening in the mind affects the body. So um, I'm not much of a philosopher, certainly not much of a philosopher of science, and I can't talk about Cartesian dualism or any of those things except to say, um, let's embrace the idea that we're a unified whole and we need to treat people as such, okay? Um, this is just another shout out, and this slide may be out of place a bit, um, to speech and language pathologists and um, their close cousins, OTs, because they have been the unsung heroes in my mind uh, during the pandemic. I've referred probably hundreds of patients to OTs or SLPs, and uh, we have not been disappointed by that. Um, so what does cognitive rehab look like? Um, 
it has a lot of different faces. Um, and uh, much of the work that happens with cognitive rehab is compensatory in nature. Um, one of the really pivotal times in my life that really shaped me was um, almost 15 years ago now, I did a sabbatical. And um, my wife repeatedly has said, let's do another one. And I have said to her, sadly, you get one. <laughs> you only get one. We used it up. There's no more sabbatical. You know, there's no, no, no more well I can go to. I used my sabbatical up. And it was lovely. And it was at a place called Ely, England, E-L-Y. Has anybody been there by chance? No? There's a famous cathedral, the Ely Cathedral. It's in Cambridgeshire. It's beautiful. And um, there used to be a world-class, very famous brain injury uh, treatment center there called the Oliver Zangwill Center, founded by Barbara Wilson, world-class, famous neuropsychologist. And uh, I trained there for part of a year. And, and my wife and kids, and my mother-in-law actually too came, and, and they wandered around the country, and I walk past the fish and chippery and the, the pound store uh, down the cobblestones every, every morning. We had a great time. And um, it was all about compensatory strategies, right? Compensatory, 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 right? Learning these strategies, learning them so well that you could integrate them. And often when we talk to our patients about rehab, they really scoff, right? They say, what is this going to do for me? Is it going to fundamentally improve my brain? You know, are you going to fix me? And um, a compensatory approach to rehab is not predicated on the idea that it's going to repair your brain. It's predicated on the idea that regardless of what happens to your brain or doesn't happen to your brain, it's going to improve your function. Okay? And at the end of the day, it's my mantra at least, it's function. It's important. It's function. Right? Um, and, and I think people really get that wrong. Like very often people are worried about to, to go a few slides back, I won't go a few slides back, but very often our patients are fixated on mechanism. How on earth did I get here? What caused this? Um, with respect, it's not a super helpful question, right? Because it detracts from a better pursuit, which is how can we get you functioning again, right? I don't know what caused it, right? It could have been 101 different things. It was probably one of these three or four or five. but. Um, we actually don't need to know most of the time, maybe not all the time, but for our purposes here, we don't need to know exactly what caused it to figure out how to help you function. We need to help you function. And um, this is just an example. This is a picture of, of the cover of a book um, of, of one way to approach this. This is compensatory strategies. My favorite, though, uh, my favorite approach to cognitive rehab is something called goal management training. And um, that was developed by... Brian Levine, who's a Michigander, proud Michigander, now living in Toronto, uh, grew up, I think, in, in Detroit, as I recall, and he's a, he's a friend of mine. Um, he developed GMT along with a, a few gentlemen at, um, at Trinity College of Dublin and, and also at Cambridge. And goal management training is this uh, really revolutionary um, approach to rehabilitating attention and executive functioning in particular, and, and it, uh, again, is not claiming to fix your brain, but what it is doing is it is helping you to be much more aware and more mindful. And the particular contribution of GMT um, to conversations about cognitive rehab is this. It's the idea that um, whether you're brain injured or whether you're not, when you make cognitive errors, um, you don't make them randomly, you're likely to make them in certain times and places and scenarios, right? So an example that I like to use here is um, we have many support groups at Vanderbilt. We used to have one that met at a local church. They, they allowed us to use their space. It was lovely. And um, one day I was leaving the church. This is probably eight or nine years ago, long before COVID. I was busy like I always am. I was running. One of my new employees was with me, uh, Aaron Collard, delightful young colleague and, and we were leaving, stopped at the gas station, okay? And uh, there was a gentleman in the support group named Tommy, gregarious and friendly and warm, always wearing um, super bright clothes and flashy tennis shoes that I love to talk to him about. And, and I really enjoyed Tommy. And I pulled my car up. It was, uh, it was a Scion XB, one of those early generations of the little bread trucks, if you guys know what those look like, right? Like a little delivery truck kind of a thing. I love that car. First new car I'd ever bought, probably ever will buy. Pulled up to the gas station. Uh, I walked up to the gas pump. 
Um, Tommy said, hey, Dr. Jackson. I looked at him. I said, hey, Tommy, as I reached to, you know, to grab the gas pump and put it in my car, put it in my car. And um, I put it back up. And I noticed I'd paid a lot in gas. And I thought, that's kind of weird. Like, wow, this gas is really expensive. It's kind of weird. Uh, it was because I'd put kerosene in my car. Okay. Wow. I didn't even know that was a thing, right? I, I didn't know that was, uh, maybe it's not in Michigan, maybe it's a Tennessee thing, but I filled my gas tank with kerosene, tank full of kerosene, and, uh, not paying attention, right? Not, not brain injured, I mean, some people might argue, but not brain injured, just not paying attention, right, in a rush. And uh, I thought, I, this is the part that's most embarrassing, I thought, you know, maybe this won't be that harmful. So Aaron and I got in the car and we drove it off. And uh, about a mile later, the car started violently shaking, you know, and I was about three miles from Vanderbilt, and I said, Aaron, Aaron had worked with us for a couple weeks. I said, Aaron, can I drop you off here? Can you walk back to campus? <laughs> Do you mind? Because I think I need to take this to the shop. And of course I did, and basically they said, that was really bad what you did, <laughs> you know. Uh, we can't really fix it, you know, you, you, so much for your car. And, and, and that was it, right? I mean, that, that was it, right? It was an expensive lesson. Um, and my wife was a little frustrated, and I was. Five minutes. Sorry, I'm going to speed up. Thanks. Um, but, but that was a cognitive error. And our patients with cognitive impairment are even more likely to make those. So what GMT does is it teaches them when they are likely to make those errors, what situations they're likely to make those errors in, and once they know that, they can avoid making those errors. So it's very heavy on mindfulness, and it's really lovely. A different approach, though, very different approach, is neuroplasticity-based cognitive rehabilitation. So in contrast to compensatory strategies, which are not gonna fix your brain, but they're gonna give you tools, neuroplasticity-based approaches are explicitly saying, we're gonna leverage this neuroplasticity that is already at work, we're gonna rebuild your brain, okay? And so there are technologies like Brain HQ and Endeavor RX, um, discussed in Norman Doidge's book, again, that's not a very good picture there, but a great book about neuroplasticity called The Brain That Changes Itself. Um, I don't know if you have that in your bookstore. You should carry it. Yeah, it's you do have it? Okay, so we've got about 60 people who are going to beat their way to your door, hopefully, and, and pick this book up. Great book. Um, but Brain HQ, uh, they're, a, they're a maker of brain games. They are claiming, purporting to improve your brain. Uh, Endeavor RX, they're a maker of video games. And the video, video games they make um, are FDA approved for ADD and ADHD. And what happens with Endeavor RX is you have a physician write you a prescription, but that prescription is for an app, okay? And you play the game, and um, it's hypothesized, at least, that it's gonna improve your cognitive functioning. We studied this with long COVID Endeavor RX. We haven't published our study yet. We didn't find a signal. Um, so these are, these are controversial, experimental, I think they're less tried and true um, than the other approaches, the traditional cognitive rehab, but they have a role. Uh, the jury's still out. Um, I'm gonna move quickly here to talk about mental health problems because uh, no discussion of, of COVID in the brain would be adequate without this. Um, in long COVID, we see anxiety, we see depression, we see OCD, we see PTSD, in a small percentage of cases, we see new symptoms of psychosis. We see providers, sadly, though, um, who still stigmatize patients often um, when they report mental health problems. And far too often, what happens is, you're a physician, I go to see you, okay? And um, I report cognitive problems, and then I report some problems with anxiety. And once I mention anxiety, often you say to me, aha, it's just the anxiety, I knew it all along, right? Um, so people are reluctant to report mental health problems, and uh, we're trying to change that. I was diagnosed with OCD in 2018, developed it relatively late in life at the age of 50, and um, I'm trying to do what I encourage other people to do uh, who have any position of prominence at all, which is talk about your mental health struggles, right? Talk about them, because the more you talk about them, the, the more the stigma decreases, right? And, and we're not there yet, but we're getting there. Um, psychotherapy for long COVID, what do you do? How do you engage? Uh, acceptance and commitment therapy is a treatment of choice. Um, it includes six pillars. Acceptance, cognitive diffusion, which is the idea that you can separate from your thoughts, contact with the present moment, 
values, committed action, self as context. Key therapeutic tasks in long COVID, owning your new identity, recognizing that yes, you have long COVID, but, but that's not the entirety of who you are. That's not all of who you are. You're more than your long COVID. Grieving your losses, finding ways to accept a new normal, understanding the ways that mental health symptoms can exacerbate long COVID symptoms. Um, when I developed my OCD, one thing I did with my therapist, I, I wrote all the time. I wrote and wrote and wrote, 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 wrote so much. I wrote all the time. And uh, I wrote an acrostic about acceptance because um, acceptance, I think, is the key. It's transformation. And uh, for me and for people with long COVID, some of this resonates. I won't read all of this. Acknowledge that your situation may never meaningfully change, even if you desperately want it to. Okay? Cut ties with a highly idealized view of the past that makes your current situation seem dire by comparison. Embrace things, I'm jumping around, as they are, not as you want them to be. Pray for grace as you learn how to treat yourself with kindness. Um, as you choose to be vulnerable with others, as people embrace you in all of your glorious mess, you'll learn to embrace yourself as well normalize your struggles, okay? A lot of value in acceptance. A reminder, long COVID doesn't always look the way that we think it might. Um, yes, it can look like this. It can look like someone on oxygen, right? With 101 medications, right? It also can look like a vibrant young woman who seems just fine, right? Who may not be. So let's not succumb to this, to this um, misnomer that everyone with long COVID looks like they have it, right? Because a lot of people, um, they're really minimized and marginalized because they don't look sick, right? Indeed, they're very sick. This is Robert Frost. Um, he famously said, I've got one slide to go. He famously said the only way around is through, right? Um, and, and the truth for people with mental health challenges, cognitive problems as well, is that um, cognitive rehab can help. It can be transformative, right? Uh, Neuroplasticity-based cognitive rehabilitation, it can be transformative. Um, psychotherapy can be transformative. And yet, in dealing with chronic illnesses, there are no shortcuts, right? There are no shortcuts. It's hard work. And um, our opportunity, our challenge, our opportunity, really our privilege, is to come alongside our patients with great skill and to say, um, you can do hard things right? You can do really hard things, right? Not going to insult you by pretending this is easy, it's hard, and you can do hard things. With the right support, you can do really hard things. And, and what a high privilege it is for us to partner with these patients, to remind them and walk through seasons with them where they can do really hard things. Thank you. Jim, just thank you very much. I, I love that, that ending, right? That this, this concept of the privilege that all of us have to be able to serve with our patients, with our clients, with our community members, sometimes with our family members, and sometimes with ourselves, and to acknowledge that we can all do hard things, and also we all deserve equitable treatment, and treatment that doesn't differentiate the, the mind and the body, but instead thinks of us as a holistic person, who lives in a family and lives in a community and deserves to get really excellent care, including all of our interprofessional disciplines or, or professions, um, as well as just embracing that we're with this imperfect battle with chronic illness, which I think has applications well beyond long COVID, that we can talk about brain-based blindness. We can talk about um, we can talk about diabetic, um, diabetic neuropathy and how that impacts, and we can talk about schizophrenia and co-occurring um, opioid use disorder and how those, all of those chronic illnesses, we can provide help and hope for people um, that experience those. So thank you so much, Dr. Jackson. That was just wonderful. Yeah. Right, and again, thank you all for attending this evening, and, and I'll just put in another note that we'll be having our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Conference, which is tomorrow in this same room, again, sponsored by the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion under the leadership of Dr. Betty Dennis, um, that will feature 
Our presenters from Integrated Services of Kalamazoo, I'm looking at, at Jeff Patton because he, as the Executive Director of Integrated Services of Kalamazoo, we're really proud to have Dr. Yvonne Jackson, no relation to, to Dr. Jim Jackson, but speaking about some of her amazing research and also to have the street outreach team from Western Michigan University School of Medicine as our presenters as well as Dr. Jim Jackson and uh, look forward to seeing some of you there. And, um, and then also I just want to put in a plug for the Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion in the College of Health and Human Services has put on a really amazing series of, of lunch and learns. And so we'll have our April 7, 17th um, lunch and learn, which is our final lunch and learn for the, for the academic year featuring Dr. Jory Ravadas um, talking about health literacy and its impact on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then we're really pleased that we've got our almost our full slate of Lunch and Learn um, presenters, including Dr. Ale Karoga, who's the president of Corwell Health, who'll be presenting to us on September, I think also 17th, right? On September 17th at our first um, next academic year Lunch and Learn. So all of those activities are open to all members of our community, all stakeholders, so please, you know, tell your family, tell your friends, and welcome them to our Lunch and Learns, as well as activities like this Burian Lecture and the um, DEI conference tomorrow. So thank you so much.